today we are going to be talking about colic surgery um, and basically what a little bit more about it. What does it mean um, for you guys as horse owners or uh, trainers, barn managers, um, and kind of what potential outcomes there are for that. So um, for one, I just want to start off. This is a photo um, of a horse that had colic surgery, but um, she was also pregnant at the time. Um, so she is in what we would call a hernia belt. Um, so with this abdominal binder, um, these, um, one of the common um, I guess misconceptions is that every horse that has colic surgery will need um, a, a belly band or an abdominal bandage or something like that. Um, and that is not the case. Most of horses that undergo colic surgery actually do not need anything. Um, again, only ones where we have um, concerns about the incision or um, or extra weight added to the incision for like, if they were pregnant like this one um, are the ones. So um, I just wanted to put that in there that this is um, the the exception rather than the rule. So um, for just kind of a brief outline, we will start with kind of definition of colic and some of the basics. Um, what basically why it's important, the significance um, of it, and then go through some anatomy. The anatomy is fairly important. Um, with regards to um, outcome and, and, you know, what part of the, um, the horse is affected definitely impacts the prognosis. Um, so we will go over that. I'll try to make it pretty basic. Um, all of the images throughout, um, or I should say as many of the images as possible are from my own clinical cases, aside from the anatomy section. So the anatomy section, I did take um, some of the models from the glass horse, which is a um, educational tool that was put out from the University of Georgia, actually. Um, and it, I think it's around $10 um, for the one that you can see here, the horse owner's guide to colic. Um, and it really helps um, kind of um, people get a good idea of what's actually, what the anatomy looks like when things happen, impactions, displacements, um, all the stuff that we'll talk about. Um, you can get a, it's it's a really good visualization of, um, of what is actually occurring in the abdomen. So um, we have one as well that's for, um, based for veterinary students, that one's a little bit more um, I think that one's around 40 or $50, um, but the, the horse owner's guide one is about $10. Um, and um, yeah, if you just Google that, it, it oftentimes comes up. It's usually like a science kind of 3D um, model. Um, the only thing I will say is that it works much better on... Um, on um, Windows-based products. So if you do have a Mac, um, it has to be an older version of that. So I'll just kind of put that in there. But um, those images are from um, there as we go. Um, we'll then talk about diagnostics that um, either your referring vet will do on the farm, or um, if you do have to go to a hospital, what the referral center may do um, and why and what that's going to tell us. Um, there's really only kind of three, maybe four basic indications for surgery. So we'll kind of go over, um, what cases we elect to treat surgically and what cases we don't. Um, and then in the end, we'll talk about kind of outcomes and, um, overall prognosis for, for various, um, forms. So we will jump right into colic. So the term colic is um is is a just a non-specific term to describe abdominal pain. Um, so all it means when someone says my horse is showing signs of colic, my horse is colicking, all that means is that um, the horse has abdominal pain is showing signs of abdominal pain. Um, it is not specific to um, to any particular disease, lesion, anything like that. So that is a common misconception that. Um, that we'll kind of discuss right now. Um, there's a variety of sources of abdominal pain. Um, it could be the GI tract, which it is most most commonly. And that's honestly what the remainder of this hour will kind of talk about the GI tract. Um, but they absolutely can have abdominal pain and show signs of colic from um, either the kidneys or the bladder, if they have kidney stones, um, the ovaries, uterus, or testicles, depending on um, which gender the horse is, if they have a 
um, uterine torsion or a testicular torsion, they are going to be showing signs of colic and that those signs of colic are unrelated to the gastrointestinal tract. So um, that's one. And then the liver and spleen are less common, but they absolutely can also show signs of pain. So just because a horse um, is showing signs of colic does not mean it has to be um, gut related. Um, so again, most of the time it is. And so that's what the remainder of um, the talk will be on, but it does not have to be. It, it, it is a non-specific term that just means abdominal pain. So why do we care um, about that? And the, the reason is it is very common. So um, colic is the most common equine emergency. So um, of all the emergencies um, that will happen, you know, I was going to say tonight in the state of Michigan, but there's a lot of people that are not in Michigan tonight. So of all the emergencies, um, equine emergencies that are going to happen across the U.S., um, probably most of them or the, the most common emergency is colic or a horse showing signs of abdominal pain. Um, thankfully, most of these types of colic um, resolve with minimal treatment and they're what we call uh, spasmodic or just gas colic. So um, there's not actually a twist. There's not actually a um, obstruction, impaction, nothing like physically wrong with the, the GI tract. Or the bowel, um, it just the bowel, is, you know, spasms in a certain way, um, traps a little bit of gas, and then that causes discomfort. So, um, thankfully, the majority of it will resolve without, um, with minimal treatment or sometimes even no treatment. Um, and overall, so of all the cases of, of horses that are showing signs of colic, surgery is required in less than 10% of them. So, um, just because, you know, your horse is colicking or your neighbor's horse or the a horse at your barn, um, no one needs to jump to the conclusion that it's going to need surgery because, again, less than 10 percent of all episodes of colic um, result in surgery. Um, I definitely see more than 10 percent, but by the time they get to me, um, they they those are the ones that didn't resolve with me medical management. So um, we're talking about the ones that, you know, don't all of the ones that resolve um, before they would before they get to me. So the ones that come to me are usually the ones that um, have not resolved with with treatment. So just a brief history. Most of you guys are familiar with this signs of colic. Um, so flank watching is one. Um, and so I've got a little video here. Um, this horse actually had, this is one of the ones that are the unusual version. Um, so ones that are not associated with GI tract. Um, this horse is clipped um, in this region here um, because this horse actually had um, uh, liver issues. He had a... Um, a stone in his um, bile duct. And so he had some liver issues. And so he is flank watching right now. Um, and again, this is signs of colic, um, but um, this particular case was not GI related. But again, it just speaks to the point that it does not have to be associated with the guts. So um, that is an example of flank watching. Oftentimes they'll be pawing at the ground, uh, stretching out, um, lying down repeatedly, getting up, lying down, getting up, lying down, or um, rolling. So here's an example of rolling. Rolling is a bit more of a severe sign of colic. So flank watching is pretty mild. Um, this is a little bit more of a, a more severe um, signs of colic or showing more dis severe discomfort. So this horse, you can see rolls, then lays there, then rolls and lays there. This is not, um, it's cut, you know, covered in shavings. Um, this is not a Oh, they just gave me fresh shavings type of a roll. Um, you know, he's he's pretty head to toe covered in shavings um, and, um, you know, rolling around because he's, oops, sorry about that, um, in discomfort. Um, so another, I guess I would say misconception is um, that when horses are colicking and they roll, that they can um, twist their, their guts. Um, and to be honest, um, they are likely rolling because something, whether it's twisted or not, something is already very wrong in the abdomen. And so they are rolling to say something is very wrong in my abdomen. Um, that's a little bit of a misconception that, oh, don't let the horse roll because they'll twist. Um, usually the horse is rolling because something is already twisted. Um, so, um, the, the, it's not worth trying to, um, 
get, get anyone injured, um, to keep the horse from going down and rolling. Um, again, it, it just means that there's, there's something, um, wrong and something going on. So, um, you know, definitely call your vet out to evaluate that. Um, but don't try to, um, you know, keep the horse or prevent the horse from rolling, um, thinking that you're going to prevent um, something from twisting because oftentimes that has already happened, which is why the horse is rolling. Okay. Now this is a little bit, I'm going to, I'm going to try not to go into a ton on this. Um, this is important for surgery for sure. Um, but I don't want to get too medical. Um, so the categories of colic that, that makes us decide whether it's something that we can manage medically or whether it's something that needs to potentially have surgery. Um, the biggest thing is if it's a strangulating lesion or if it's a non-strangulating lesion. And that relates solely to the blood supply. So um, in strangulating lesions, um, the blood supply is disrupted. So something is twisted to a point where it has kinked off or um, occluded the blood supply to a portion of bowel. Um, that would classify a strangulating lesion. Um, a non-strangulating lesion um, would mean that whatever is going on is not disrupted or um, altered the blood supply in any way. Um, so examples of a non-strangulating lesion would be either an impaction or a displacement, which we will talk about both of those later. Um, but those are examples of something that is non-strangulating. So there, I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong in the abdomen, and I'm not saying that he might not need surgery. Um, but if the blood supply is intact, um, then that would be considered a non-strangulating lesion. Um, and the reason why this matters um, and why it's it's important to try and differentiate whether it is strangulating or non-strangulating um, is kind of in the things that, that will go down here. So um, this is, is an example of a strangulating lesion. So you can see um, there this portion of intestine um, was the blood supply was occluded very sharply along this line. Um, so this bowel, nice and healthy. These are nice, healthy vessels. Um, this is, is not alive anymore. So this is ischemic, um, as we talked about. And this, now that we've corrected it and either untwisted it or um, removed whatever was occluding or impeding that blood supply, this blood is now, this is what we call reperfusion. So um, this tissue, um, even though it's really, really damaged, is um, being reperfused with blood. And so that actually can then cause even more damage to this tissue. So this segment here would need to be removed in this this horse. Um, and so um, again, this because a section of the intestine does not have blood supply and is actively dying, um, this is a much more severe form of colic than the non-strangulating. So this is a similar, this is small intestine here that we're looking at. And I do apologize if anyone is a little squeamish there. It's hard to talk about colic without um, images of the GI tract. So there are going to be images throughout. And so I do apologize. There's no videos other than the ones I just showed you, but there are going to be um, images of, of intestine. Uh, so this is small intestine here. And then this is small intestine over here. You can see there's an impaction in my hand. It's very sausage-like and like a tube-like structure, um, but the blood supply is perfectly fine. Um, so this is the vessel right here. There's no disruption to the blood supply. Um, the bowel itself is nice and healthy. So um, so again, the, the reason why it's really important to differentiate strangulating versus non-strangulating um, is, is based on the time that we have to, to move and um, kind of how how sick they are. So strangulating lesions, um, they can be, they're oftentimes, because this happens very quickly, it is an acute onset of severe pain. Um, so they will be, you know, fine, ate their breakfast, um, you know, turned out to pasture, running around, kicking, um, acting totally fine, maybe rode them that morning. And then all of a sudden, um, it's like a light switch and they are down, they are rolling, they are very painful. Um, and again, they were totally fine just an hour ago. Um, so acute onset and oftentimes very severe pain. 
Um, whereas non-strangulating lesions, those are a little bit more gradual of an onset. And oftentimes the pain is not quite as severe. Um, so that would be like, oh, they didn't totally finish their grain the night before, or were a little bit um, you know, quieter, maybe not passing quite as much manure, drinking a little less water for a couple of days, um, you know, a little bit more of a, a milder gradual onset. Um, so that, that was a, one thing that kind of indicates strangulating versus non-strangulating or can give it a little bit more, um, indication. Um, strangulating lesions are oftentimes very, very sick. Um, they can have really severe blood work changes. Um, and if you think about it, it makes sense because if something is twisted and there is a section of intestine that is dying, um, that is a, a, a big impact on your overall stability and your overall health. Um, whereas the non-strangulating lesions, um, those are you know, you might be mildly dehydrated, but they're, you're usually fairly stable um, if you just have, again, like an impaction or a displacement. Um, and, and examples of strangulating lesions would be a pedunculated lipoma. Um, dogs and cats get lipomas on the outside of their body. Horses, unfortunately, get them on the inside of their body. And they, they form on kind of long stalks, which is why we say pedunculated Um and those act as almost like little lassos and they can get twisted around the intestine. And so that is what happened in this one down here. Um, uh, a lipoma, which you can probably see it underneath down here, um, was on a long stalk and just got wrapped right around this big loop and cut off the blood supply. Um, so that is one example. Another example would be a volvulus and that could be a, a large colon volvulus. Um, or a small intestinal volvulus. And that just means a volvulus means everything kind of twisted all the way around um, on its root. So those, again, things are, are very, um, they happen acutely, very severe pain. They get very sick very quickly. Um, strangulating lesions 100% need surgery. That will not resolve without surgery. And the faster you can get them to surgery, the better the outcome. Thankfully, most cases of colic are not strangulating. Most of them are non-strangulating. Um, and so we'll kind of talk about that as we go. But that is why it's really important to try and differentiate. Is the blood supply intact or not? Um, because that is one of the number one reasons why we either elect to go straight to surgery or we elect medical management for a while. So it's kind of a little bit of a why in the road for decision making based on um, this. Is the blood supply affected or is it not? So if there's any major questions on that, um, I told Dr. Shakota or anyone else to um, let us know because it will kind of build upon this. And this is a little bit, um, um, it, it, I don't want to say you have to have medical um, knowledge or anything along the lines of this, but it, this is a little bit harder to grasp um, just because we are talking about um, strangulating, non-strangulating um, blood supply and, and things like that. So moving on to anatomy and these, all these image here, like I said, are from the glass horse. Um, that's, uh, that was created out of the University of Georgia. Um, so what we'll do is this, you can see this example of a horse here. Um, it has all of the anatomy on the inside. And since the anatomy is fairly important for this, um, all the next images are going to be zoomed in. So you won't see the outline of the horse anymore. You still will see the rib cage here and the vertebrae, um, but it will be zoomed in a little bit. Um, and so the main things that we're going to talk about is kind of the flow of ingesta. So or the horses eat something, they get swallowed down their esophagus, enters the abdomen and starts with the stomach. And so then it goes stomach to the small intestine, to the cecum, to the large colon, and then it goes out the small colon to the rectum. So these are kind of these five um, are kind of the big five um, structures. And so we'll go through each of them individually, just so you have a bit of a better idea um, of what can go wrong in the horse. So the stomach. Um, and again, we're zoomed in. So the horse is still, um, we're looking at the left side of the horse here. Um, so the stomach is mostly on the left side of the horse. Um, it's very well protected under the rib cage. Um, and unfortunately, it is not really surgically accessible. So 
we make in the horse, I'll go back one, our colic incision is usually from about here to about here. So this is where we make the incisions and they are right on ventral midline. Um, if you look, this is where the stomach is. So I can absolutely feel the stomach in surgery, but I cannot see the stomach in surgery. I'm usually anywhere between my elbow to my shoulder, um, deep in when I'm palpating the stomach. So, um, I can feel what's going on in the, in the uh, stomach, but unfortunately the, the horse or abdomen is just way too big. Unlike a dog, a cat, um, we cannot exteriorize the stomach and we cannot access the stomach. So unfortunately, issues with the stomach like gastric compactions are, are not something that we can really manage uh, surgically because there's not a whole lot of access to that. So um, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about the stomach because um, thankfully it's not a common reason for colic in horses. Um, and it doesn't really relate to surgery, um, just because we can't really access it. So moving on to the small intestine. Um, so here's the outline of esophagus going right to the stomach. Now the stomach is kind of um, shadowed a bit because now we're talking about the small intestine. So the small intestine is the next segment. Um, there, there is a lot of small intestine in the horse. There is about 75 feet of it and it goes, um, it can get trapped and go places that it's not supposed to because there the 75 feet is a lot. Um, and so 75 feet, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of space um, and places for that to go where it doesn't belong or where it shouldn't go. So unfortunately, of the, the, the diseases that affect the small intestine and cause colic in horses, um, in at least in the, the northern area, um, most of these are strangulating lesions. Now, I will say, those of you that are down south, um, coastal Bermuda hay is associated with ileal impactions, and that is the, the um, other than strangulating lesions of the small intestine, ileal impactions are, um, are also seen. Um, so in, in, I guess it depends area-wise, in the state of Michigan, in the north, um, small intestinal lesions are usually strangulating because we don't have coastal Bermuda hay. So the likelihood of having an impaction in your small intestine is, is low. I see maybe two a year. Um, but when I worked at the University of Georgia, um, it was very common. And I would say it was half of them were strangulating and half of them were not, which meant half of them, the blood supply was twisted and cut off. And then the other half was, it was not. And that was more of like an impaction. So um, again, it, up in the north, um, it is usually strangulating. So here in Michigan, it is. Um, if you guys are down um, um, in kind of the Georgia, Alabama, southern area where there's Costa Bermuda hay, um, you may have some that are that are non-strangulating as well. All right, moving on to the cecum. So it goes from the small intestine to the cecum. The cecum is on the right side of the horse. So you can see the horse is facing the other direction now. Um, and this is a blind ended pouch. Um, so it comes in through here, goes all the way down to this apex and then goes back up to this base before leaving and going into the colon. Um, this is a, a tricky structure. Um, of all the things that can be wrong in the horse, the cecum is my least favorite. Um, and the reason is um, because there's, it basically comes in in this region and it kind of leaves in this region. So this big blind end um, is very problematic because if they get issues there, if they get an impaction there and, and, and things, um, there it's really, really hard to resolve because um, it's not like um, a tube where things go in one side and come out the other. Um, they have to go in one side, go all the way through, and then kind of out still near that same opening. And so the problem is these, the horses that have cecal problems, um, we call it the silent, the silent colic killer. Um, they will often have very, very mild signs of colic until this is so, so large that it is about to rupture. Um, and unfortunately in horses, um, if they have a GI rupture and things um, tear or pop, if you will, um, that unfortunately is is the end. We cannot manage 
um, uh, a rupture in horses. And so there is, there is no, nothing that we can do, um, regardless of the, the technological advances, money, anything like that. If a horse has a, a rupture of a GI viscous and of the things that are going to rupture, um, cecum is a common one. The other one, unfortunately is the stomach, which is also, like I said, unfortunate because we can't access those. Um, but of the places for, for a horse to rupture their intestine, um, cecum is, cecum and stomach are going to be at the top of the list. And so I find these cases very, um, frustrating because again, they, the horse oftentimes does not show any signs of colic until they are about to rupture. And at that point in time, you're oftentimes a little bit too late. So cecum is one of the structures here. Um, that I would say would be the scarier one to have problems in. Thankfully, it's not very common, um, but it is it is not my favorite. Okay, moving on to the large colon. This is by far and away the most common. So of the horses that have colic, it resolves on its own, you know, with a dose of banamine, maybe some hand walking. Um, the vet comes out, evaluates it. Um, things are looking good. Um, most of the cases are large colon. So by far and away, this is the, the most common abnormality um, or the most common reason for colic. Usually this is again, non-strangulating. So it does not affect the blood supply, which is good. Um, oftentimes these can be managed medically. They oftentimes don't need surgery. Um, and so again, thankfully these of all the things that can go wrong, um, most of the problems are large colon. So when looking at the horse from the left side, um, this is kind of how things look. So I guess we'll, we'll start on the right side. So this is the cecum, which is kind of blurred out a little bit. It goes in from the cecum into this um, colon and it goes down this part here all the way around to the front. Now we'll switch over to the left side. It goes all the way to the back. And then this is what's called the pelvic flexure. And this is back towards the pelvis, which is why they call it that. And it's they call it a flexure because it makes a, a whole 180 degree turn. So it goes from here all the way around to here. And then again, it goes, oops, sorry about that all the way back up and around, and then we go up into the small colon. So this again is the large colon. You can see why it's it's called the large colon. It is fairly sizable. Um, this pelvic flexure back here is a common place for impactions because it has to make that kind of hairpin turn. Um, and as you can see, there's this is actually all free. Um, there are no attachments to this other than up here at kind of the dorsal body wall. So this colon um, is not securely attached in the horse's abdomen, and it is kind of free to move about as it pleases, um, which can cause problems. So some of the problems we'll talk about um, is when this colon basically displaces um, to a, a a location in the abdomen it's not supposed to be. Um, so it can move um, kind of as it as it wants. Thankfully, most of the time it stays where it should be, but um, there, this is all free. There is no attachments here. So um, the way it is shown in the horse, um, again, the only attachment is way up here by the dorsal body wall. Um, okay, and then lastly, the small colon. Um, so we go from the large colon to the small colon, and you can see this is where all the fecal balls are made. So everything, the ingesta starts as liquid in the stomach, stays liquid through the small intestine as it gets to the cecum and the large colon, then it starts turning, um, they start, the horse starts absorbing more of the liquid out of it, and it starts becoming more dense like feces. And then when it gets to the small colon, that's when it actually makes the fecal balls that we see. So um, small colon, again, can be either strangulating or non-strangulating. Um, so it can kind of go either way. Um, and then the small colon goes right out to the rectum. So again, small colon can be either or. Large colon, thankfully, is the most common and is usually non-strangulating. Um, and then small intestine in the northern states is usually strangulating. In the southern states can be either strangulating or non-strangulating. Um, and again, that th this is not anything that's super important to horse owners themselves because this is all what your veterinarian is going to be um, thinking about, working on, trying to determine when they're evaluating your horse. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of give you the, the basics, um, so the rundown of that. 
So this is with all of the GI tracked back in place on the right side and the left side. You can actually even see the spleen is added here. So that's the spleen. This is the aorta. Um, so again, everything now back all together. Um, so it goes stomach, small intestine, cecum, large colon, and small colon. Um, things that go to surgery. So of, you know, I'm a surgeon. So of the horses that I take to colic surgery, by far and away, most of them are small intestine or large colon. Um, so these two are the most common things for me to take to surgery. Again, if you're looking at all horses that have signs of colic, majority of them are small col or of our large colon and majority of them um, honestly resolve with minimal treatment don't require surgery. But again, the ones that do actually make it to the surgery table, um, most of them are going to be small intestine or large colon. Okay, so moving on to diagnostics. So this kind of just tells us a little bit about what the vets do on the farm and what the vets do um, if they require referral. Um, and why kind of we do that. So we always start with a physical exam um, and we want to look at everything. So temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, all of those things. Um, but GI sounds are one that's really important. So I want to be listening to their GI sounds. Do they have GI sounds? Do they not have GI sounds? If they don't have GI sounds, um, that is most common with like impactions um, because again, things aren't moving. Things are static. They are impacted. Um, there is a blockage. Um, I also really want to know um, pain level. Um, and again, because strangulating lesions need to be addressed and treated with surgery oftentimes um, or always very quickly. So pain level, I, um, I, I want to know, are they really, really painful? Because that's going to point me towards that direction. Or are they, you know, very mild? Um, because those can be managed more oftentimes with medical management on the farm, don't need to go anywhere, um, oftentimes resolved by themselves. And then hydration status. So this horse um, has very, very tacky mucous membranes and tacky, you can see its tongue even. Um, so this horse is very dehydrated. And if you look closely, there's actually a purple line um, right here along its gum line. And that is unfortunately called a toxic line. And that means that horse is very, very sick. So this horse had a lot of dead, it has a strangulating lesion and had a lot of dead intestine. Um, and this horse was very systemically compromised and very critical in critical condition when it came in. So this toxic line, uh, you know, I, the horse walked in um, and that's the first thing that I did was look at that. And that clued me in instantly that we need to stabilize this horse right now. Um, this, this is a very, very sick horse. So we start with a physical exam to kind of see where we're at and, um, and what needs to be done next. Um, and then once we're done with our physical exam, um, placing a nasogastric tube is very, very important in horses. And the reason is, is horses cannot vomit. So if a horse has a blockage and their stomach is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, they do not have the ability to to vomit. So um, their esophagus, um, basically their little sphincter at the bottom of their esophagus is really, really tight. And it is a one way valve. Things go in, things do not come back out. Um, and so because of that, if their stomach gets too big, it can rupture, which is why I said that stomach is one of the common, um, other than the cecum, the, the stomach is one of the, the GI structures that can rupture. And like I said, unfortunately, there is nothing we can do when that happens. That is, we are at the end. Um, and so placing a nasogastric tube or passing a tube um, into its nostril, um, down its esophagus and into its stomach can absolutely be life saving. Um, because if, if the horse has a really, really full stomach and, you know, we are emptying liters and liters out of this horse's stomach, um, that can that can be life saving because they can rupture their their stomach on the trailer ride to the referral center for surgery. So. For one, it's really important um, because it can save their life. And two, um, the other thing is if they have reflux like this horse, so this horse you can see has um, fluid and reflux just means that they're, um, you were able to get fluid from the stomach. And this is oftentimes saliva. This is bile. This is, um, you know, anything that they drank recently. Um, so, and the, the term is again, reflux because horses can't vomit, but it's, it's essentially, um, 
vomit. Um, but again, we, we, the term that we use is reflux. Um, also, it's really, really key that if you obtain reflux, that tells you that things are not leaving the stomach. And so you do not want to um, administer anything. Um, so I know that when most people have colic or horses that colic, um, the vet will come out, the vet will pass a tube, and the vet will give them, you know, a, a gallon or a couple gallons of, of fluid to try and hydrate, hydrate them, hydrate the impaction. Um, and I fully agree that is what you should normally do, as long as you don't get any reflux. If you do get reflux, that's telling you things aren't leaving the stomach. So putting more things in the stomach is just going to put that horse at more risk for the stomach to rupture. So... Um, so no enteral fluids, even if you're like, Hey, you, you know, last time we just gave it enteral fluids or gave it fluids down the nasogastric tube and that fixed the, the colic. Let's do that again. Um, if, if reflux was obtained, um, we definitely do not want to do that. Um, because we will just make that stomach that much bigger. Um, the next, um, um, diagnostic is rectal palpation. Sadly, you can, only feel um, a third, even with the longest of long arms, only feel a third at most of the abdomen. So um, Dr. Shirkota actually took this picture just a couple of weeks ago. I was trying to describe what I was feeling for the students. Um, so I had one arm in and I was trying to show basically the structure that I was feeling, the the kind of the size, the, the texture of it and describe that for the students so they could have an idea. Um, and of course, she got this picture making me look really silly, but um, again, rectal palpation is very helpful to feel, you know, potentially what's going on is, does it feel like things are out of place? Does it feel like, um, can you feel an impaction? Can you feel, um, you know, really dilated loops of small intestine? You know, what, what are you feeling? Um, but again, you can only feel a, the caudal third. So you can't, there's a lot of course that you cannot feel. Um, so it's not uncommon just because the the rectal is normal does not mean something is not wrong. Um, because again, we, we, even with long, long arms, there's not a ton that we can, um, feel, but it is very important because it can tell us a bit more what's going on. Um, ultrasound is also, um, helpful and important. Um, if you think, of how deep we can ultrasound. So if this is at the skin surface and, you know, we're going down maybe 20 centimeters, um, again, we can only image the outer portion. So even with the best ultrasound, really strong penetrating ultrasound, we cannot go very deep into the horse's abdomen. Um, and so we have to kind of do all of these things to put the pieces together because with 75 feet of small intestine, um, a huge, large colon that's larger than I am, you know, it is hard to know exactly what's going on um, in the horse's abdomen. It's a little bit of a kind of a black box. And so that's why we do all of these diagnostics to kind of piece the, the um, to piece the pieces together, I guess I should say, um, to figure out what, what we think is going on. So this um, is an example. These are loops of small intestine. So these look like um, bike tires or balloon animals. Um, this is very abnormal. And you can actually even see little feed material is kind of settling out in there. So this tells us that there is something wrong with the small intestine. So again, up here in the north, this would be very suspicious for a strangulating small intestinal lesion. Um, in the south, this could still be an ileal impaction, which would be non-strangulating, and you could try to manage medically. But again, um, these loops of small intestine are very abnormal. Um, so if you see this, that is a concern. Um, and um, oftentimes, small intestinal lesions need referral um, because they they are very hard to manage in the um, in the field. So, ultrasound you can see dilated small intestine. You sometimes can tell if the colon is in the right spot. So, if the colon is um, slid out of place and gone to you know a, another vicinity in the abdomen and, and is displaced to a different location, you can oftentimes see that too. Um, so ultrasound can be very helpful for those two things. But again, we are still limited. We can only see kind of the outer, maybe 20 centimeters. So the outer, probably this, this much of the abdomen is kind of all we can really see. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, blood work or peritoneal fluid. Um, that is, if you're at a hospital, that is definitely something we can do. If, if you are just at your farm and the vet is coming out, 
they can't really run a lot of blood work um, from their truck. So um, whether or not they um, take blood, bring it back to their hospital, run it, um, or even peritoneal fluid. And so um, in this image here, between these loops of small intestine, there is fluid that bathes all of these loops of small intestine. And that term is called peritoneal fluid. So there's fluid that kind of helps keep things sliding amongst each other. And um, that getting a sample of that fluid can kind of tell us the overall health of the small intestine or of the intestine in general. So um, what is potentially going on in the abdomen? Is it strangulating again or is it not strangulating? Does it look surgical or not? Um, we can oftentimes get those answers from looking at the peritoneal fluid. Now, that being said, um, it's not common for people to take or veterinarians to take peritoneal fluid in the field because um, we oftentimes want to run tests on it. And if you're out in the field, again, you don't have the capabilities to do a lot of blood work um, and to run around a lot of analysis. So I put this as plus or minus. Um, if you're at a hospital and you get referred in, um, we were, we're oftentimes going to do these things. If we're just doing a workup in the field at the farm, we are not going to do these things frequently. So that's why there's a plus or minus. Um, and again, same with ultrasound. There's a lot, a lot of places now that have portable ultrasounds, but not every ambulatory that does. Um, so these three are going to be the key things that should happen kind of every time um, a colic examination is performed. Ultrasounds can be helpful if you have it. And then again, if you're at a clinic, we're probably going to add these as well. All right. So, um, and again, this is peritoneal fluid. This is red. So this would be very consistent for a strangulating lesion where the blood supply is affected. Um, so this would be, I would say, we need to go to surgery right now. This is normal. So normal fluid is usually yellow. Um, and then this, unfortunately, is consistent with a rupture. So if it's brown and has feed material in it, that is um, unfortunately often consistent with a rupture. So indications for surgery. There's three main ones, but also a fourth one. So as we alluded to before, indications for surgery. If you suspect that there's a strangulating lesion, we have to go to surgery. That is the only option to save that horse. So here is an example. Um, this is one of those fatty lipomas. It's on a long little stalk or a lasso. It got looped around this loop of small intestine and this small intestine is now very dead. Um, there is no way to medically resolve this. This horse has to go to surgery and we have to remove this dead intestine is the only way to save the horse. So if we suspect something is strangulated, surgery is, is where we are heading. The other thing is if the horse is just so, so painful, we can't keep it standing. They are rolling. They are thrashing. Um, they are, um, we just can't keep them on their feet. That is another reason of why we have to take them to surgery. Sometimes it's not even a strangulating lesion. Sometimes it could be a displacement. It could even be an impaction. But if they are violently throwing themselves down um, and we can't manage their pain, we're, we're a bit oftentimes forced to take them to surgery because um they have to be able to tolerate medical management. And if they're so uncomfortable, um, then then we, we oftentimes don't have an option. Um, the third reason is if they're not responding to medical treatment. So they have an impaction and we have been treating that impaction with enteral fluids day in, day out, and they are just not responding. You know, we are on day three, day four, um, no, no improvement. Those are ones that we oftentimes will take to surgery, even if they're not painful, and even if it's not strangulating. If they're just not responding and medical management doesn't work, then we got to go to surgery. Um, and the last test, we don't do this very often. The last is just a diagnostic test. So this is more common in small animals where um, we just do an explore. And, and sometimes, you know, we'll do an, uh, uh, in small animals, we'll do a negative or an explore thinking there's a foreign body and there's not a foreign body. And we call that a negative explore. Um, we do not do that near as commonly in horses. So um, again, if we think there might be a mass and we've done all the other diagnostics we can do, um, but again, this would not be on emergency basis. So I put this way at the bottom because this, um, this is not um, what this talk is kind of referring to. All right, so moving along, now we're just going to talk about prognosis for the end here. Um, so if the horse does need colic surgery, um, what are the chances? Um, because that's, again, kind of what, now that we have all the, the framework and the basis down, um, that is kind of the point of the talk. So small intestine. Overall, 
small intestine compared to large colon, overall, the prognosis is, is lower when you compare across the board, um, all cases that go to colic surgery, large colon cases versus small colon or small intestine cases, the small intestine cases in general will have a lower prognosis. Um, and the reason is that small intestine cases most of the time are strangulating, whereas large intestine cases, as we talked about, most of the time are non-strangulating. So it makes a huge impact whether or not that blood supply is affected. If the bowel is dying, um, the animal is way, way sicker. Um, and so their overall health is, is much more hangs in the balance um, if there is compromise to that intestine. So um, with strongly related to the prognosis, time to surgery is critical for these. Um, so if you notice that your horse is colicking, call out the vet, vet evaluate, said, no, I don't think this is going to resolve with medical management. They send it into a referral center and we evaluate it and get it to surgery within eight hours of the colic starting. Um, they have about a 75% survival again. So if that is seen, seen acutely, um, evaluated, um, taken to surgery, um, overall prognosis about 75%. Um, if it's, we try to manage it, doesn't be managed medically, then we refer, then we're not sure if we're going to go to surgery. Um, and that's very valid. Not all horses have a surgical option. It's a big decision. Um, you know, it, it is sometimes we need to take time to think about it and make sure that's the right decision. Some horses don't have a surgical option. And then, um, you know, at the last minute, then they do. So, um, the, Th things happen and, and sometimes it can be delayed and it can be, you know, 12 or more hours. Sometimes horses can start colicking, you know, right after night checks and then you go to check them in the morning and they've been colicking all night long and you had no idea. Um, so again, this, this absolutely happens, but the prognosis definitely goes down. So less than 50% if it's been a while that they've been experiencing these colic, um, colic onset um, before we get them to surgery. And the reason is they are just, um, the, the bowel, as the bowel dies, um, the horse gets sicker. So, um, the horses are just more systemically compromised. And then the last thing that affects prognosis for small intestine is the portion of small intestine that is affected. So we said there's 75 feet of small intestine. Um, we can take about a third of that. So I have no problem removing 20 feet. I have no problem removing 25 feet. Um, that is not a big deal to me. The deal is what part of the small intestine. So um, this is um, this is the cecum. So again, the small intestine empties right into the cecum. Um, this here is the last little segment of small intestine before it goes into the cecum. So if this, this is called the ileum. And if this ileum is not affected, um, we can basically take the intestine and it's almost, this is a simplified version. Uh, I make my um, you know, 12 years of schooling seem, seem inconsequential. But if you just think of it as like splicing together a hose, um, you know, you take out the bad and then you put them together, two tubes put together, easy peasy. Um, so like this simple anastomosis, um, you know, remove up to 25 feet in the middle, um, suture right there. Those have a better prognosis than the ones that you have to completely reroute the bowel. So if this ileum is involved and the ileum empties into the cecum, if that is involved, you you basically have to attach this um, small intestine to the cecum. And that is not an easy splice together hose. You have to kind of create a whole new opening and totally reroute the ingesta. So this is a much more um, in-depth kind of um, plumbing uh, arrangement that you have to do. And so these ones have a little bit lower um, survival rate just because there's, there's more anatomy that you have to alter um, for that. But again, timing is key. If you get them here soon, 75% is still not bad. Um, and again, if, if they're even sooner than that, um, it can even be, be better. You can, you can be in the nineties, um, you know, if they get, if they get there right away. So small intestine, um, is, is kind of where we're at with that. Timing is important. And then, um, large colon. So thankfully, most of them are impactions or displacements. Probably far and away, the most common is an impaction. Um, and good thing, most of these respond to medical management. So we always try to treat impactions with medical management. 
In medical management, that would be IV fluids or enteral fluids. So we place a, a stomach tube or a nasogastric tube and we administer them fluids. Um, as long as they are not refluxing, again, as long as they are not refluxing, things are moving through, um, we give them lots of fluids to try and really hydrate that impaction um, and, and always try medical. So medical treatment has a 95% success rate. Um, and so that is very good. And so we always try medical management for impactions. Um, because we always try medical management for impactions, <laughs> The, they don't end up going to surgery until medical management has failed. So unfortunately, the ones that end up on my surgical table have been going on for a while and have we've tried for days and days and days. Um, so this success rate is sadly quite a bit lower. And it and I um I don't take offense to that by any means, but the um, the reason why this is lower is because we always try medical management first. So by time the horse gets to my operating table, that colon has been inflamed and irritated and um, and is not very healthy um, because we have been trying to manage it medically for usually days and days. And so by the time it gets to me, that colon is heavy. It is edematous. It is friable. It is very thin. Um, and it is easy to tear and easy to um, have complications because again, the ones that don't resolve medically are the worst of the worst. So we only cut impactions or take those to surgery, the worst of the worst. So that would be why the prognosis is not as great for large colon impactions. Again, if we would take them to surgery sooner, this would be much better, but we don't normally have to take them to surgery. And so that is why we typically don't, um, because again, if we, we only do surgery if we have to. And so if we don't have to, um, we try to push them medically. Um, so that is for impactions, displacements. Um, so displacement is when the colon um, moves to the wrong spot. So it either shifts to the left or it shifts to the right. Um, and again, that is not affecting the blood supply. So there's no twist. It, it just basically shifts over where it's supposed to, where it's not supposed to be. Um, good news for that is that has actually an excellent prognosis with either medical or surgical treatment. So either way, that has a really, really good prognosis. If the horse is comfortable, um, we will always try medical management, um, and, and try that first because, again, we, like I said, we only take horses to surgery if needed. Um, and so if we, if they are comfortable, we will continue to manage them medically. Surgery um, is indicated and we will take horses to surgery if they are not responding. So if it's day four, it's day five, um, they have just not responded to medical management. The colon is still in the wrong place and it will not go back. Um, then we take them to surgery and I physically put it back. Um, so one, if they don't respond and the other ones are, if they are so, so painful, even though it's, it's not a, um, strangulating lesion, if they are so painful that we can't keep them standing, we can't manage them. Um, those also have to go to surgery. So those are the two reasons why we will take them to surgery. But again, whether we take them to surgery or whether we do medical, any displacements, large colon displacements have a really, really good prognosis. i um, talking like 90% high or 95% or higher. So um, good, good volvulus, large colon volvulus. This is the most critical form of colic. So of all forms of colic, a large colon volvulus is the most severe. Um, th this is a strangulating lesion. Um, of the large colon, which you can see here. So this colon is, is not supposed to be dark purple to, to black color. This colon is dead. And this is a huge structure. I don't even have all of it out. The structure is larger than I am. Um, and so this huge structure, a huge organ being devitalized and dead, a horse cannot survive that. And if they, these horses, this is the type of colic that the horse can be found dead within hours. Um, if they're, if they started colicking overnight, you didn't know, come out in the morning, they absolutely can be find, found dead. Um, the mortality rate is, and this is not survival, this is mortality rate, is between 56 to 65%, depending on the time to surgery. Um, the colon actually starts to die within 30 minutes of the horse um, showing signs of colic. And so, I mean, I've had horses that were within, you know, right down the road, 
They started calling. They were at the facility. They were on the table, like couldn't have been a better candidate. And they still didn't make it. Um, this is an absolutely devastating form of colic. So thankfully, um, it's, again, not super common. Um, it's it's most common in especially postpartum brood bears. Um, but again, this form of colic um, is very, very serious. There's nothing more serious and more time sensitive than a large colon volvulus. All right. And then cecum, we're kind of just finishing up here. Um, cecum, like I alluded to before, impactions are what is oftentimes involved with a cecum. Um, medical treatment is is scary um, because like I said, they can spontaneously rupture. Um, this It's a blind ended pouch. So this can only expand so far before it pops. It's like a balloon. Um, so medical treatment, very scary um, because they can absolutely rupture and then you know that that's it. We can't do anything. Um, and then surgical treatment, um, is a little bit variable because oftentimes, unlike large colons where, um, you know, they can get a large colon impaction just because, you know, it's cold out, um, they didn't drink enough water, cecal impactions, they're often formed because they have some cecal um, motility issue or dysfunction, um, cecal, you know, transit. And so these can recur. Um, so I, I would say, um, Cecal, the cecum in general is not, uh, it does not play nicely with others. And so any form of colic that's associated with the cecum um, is not ideal um, because again, even with surgery, without surgery, there's, they, they're very sneaky and they, um, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. So cecum, um, I'm going to put lower on my list for prognosis and then small colon, um, Impactions are the most common things that we'll see. Um, they can get strangulating lesions as well. Um, but again, most of these will respond to medical treatment. Um, and the, the prognosis is good to excellent for medical treatment. Again, surgical treatment is also fairly good. Um, it's maybe not as good for the same exact reasons as um, the large colon, because we, we don't take them to surgery until um, medical treatment has failed. And so the actual integrity of the intestine is um, that there are, they are worse than they were um, before. And so, you know, we, we're, we kind of wait until we're shoved up against a, a wall um, before we'll sometimes take those. So, um, but overall, they still can do well. Okay, so I just have, we're almost 7.59. We're about out of time. I'm, I'm pretty much done here. I just want to briefly talk about potential complications from colic surgery and then what the recovery period looks like. So ileus, ileus is a fancy term, just meaning that the GI, GI tract is not functioning appropriately. Things are not moving from the stomach out to the rectum. Um, and so in people that have um, abdominal surgery and have ileus, they are nauseous and they're vomiting. Again, horses can't vomit, as we talked about. Um, so the, they have to have a nasogastric tube in place because they are continuing to produce reflux. And if you don't have a tube there, their stomach will rupture. Um, this is more commonly seen in small intestinal lesions, um, but it can happen with anything. Um, and again, the biggest thing is we don't know how long it's going to take for the GI to start functioning again. Um, it might take a day. It might take a week. Um, and so during that time, um, it's really hard to manage the horses because they have to get all of their nutrition and, and IV fluids and everything um, not through their GI tract. And so they have to get everything um, through, you know, the a catheter, which can be quite expensive, um, you know, hydrating a horse um, with IV fluids for that amount of time. Adhesions, that's when two pieces of intestine um, or anything, basically two structures stick together with a, um, a scar tissue that are not supposed to stick together. So here's an example. This is a small colon here, and this is a huge adhesion. Um, this big band of tissue is not supposed to be there. So that prevents this um, small colon from being able to move as it needs to um, when um, fecal balls are moving through the small colon. So this can kind of kink off this area um, and cause signs of colic, cause obstruction. Again, this is more common in small intestinal lesions than large intestinal lesions. Um, you're kind of seeing a pattern. This is the reason why small intestinal lesions overall have a lower prognosis. Um, but again, it can happen with, with anything. 
And then incisional infections, they're actually quite common in colic surgery. So one in probably five, 20% of them will develop an incisional infection. Most of the time they are self-limiting, um, don't need to be really treated with a a belly band, a hernia belt. Um, honestly, I rarely put any of mine on antibiotics. Um, so again, they're very self-limiting. They oftentimes just resolve on their own. So it's not usually a big deal, um, but it is something to note. And then lastly, um, just what the rehab period looks like. So my horse had colic surgery. What's next? Um, the first month is stall rest with hand walking. Uh, the second month, I usually say small paddock turnout just by themselves. So maybe like a round pen or an indoor arena um, where they can't get up too much speed, frolic with their friends, anything like that. Um, the third month, then they can go out with the large paddock turnout, other horses. Um, and then after that third month, um, then they can go back to gradual return to ridden exercise. And this will not inhibit them in any way from being an athlete. Um, they can absolutely be three-day eventers. They can be hunter jumpers. They can be race horses. They can be um, draft hitch horses. They can be Brood mares, they can, you know, the colic surgery itself will not affect their athletic ability. Um, so I've had horses that I've done colic surgery on go um, into the Olympics. And so it, it really does not affect um, long term athletic ability. So in summary, and I'm sorry, it's 802. So I'm happy to stay late for questions if needed. Um, in summary, colic is common but it is not specific. So it could be kidneys, it could be the liver, it could be the, um, the ovaries. It does not have to be specific to the GI tract. Um, again, I focused on surgery because that was what the talk was about, but less than 10% of cases actually require surgery. So again, don't panic if someone calls you today saying that your horse is colicking, less than 10% of them require surgery. Um, Examination, nasogastric tube and rectal are the most important findings. Those oftentimes will change. And so if you have your vet do that on the farm, um, then your vet refers it into a, a referral center or a hospital. We are going to repeat those and they oftentimes are gonna be different. Um, so even if it's an hour trailer ride, um, the they could maybe not have any reflux on the farm and they could have reflux with us. The rectal could be normal with them and it could be abnormal with us. So these things change very frequently. Um, and so that's why we absolutely are going to repeat them all because it's not uncommon for things to happen. And same thing if you your vet comes out again, um, you know, the horse was doing fine and then the next day is colicking. Um, they're going to come out and they're likely going to repeat all these things because they will oftentimes change. Um, main indications for surgery. So what cases do we say, hey, we got to go to surgery on this? Um, anytime we think the blood supply is affected, um, has to go to surgery. If they are so uncontrollably painful that we can't keep them standing, those are ones that have to go to surgery. Um, and then anything that's unresponsive to medical management. So they're not responding to IV fluids. We're trying to give them fluids via the nasogastric tube. And it's just, we are not making any progress. Those are ones that we'll take to surgery as well. Um, but overall, not, not across the board, but overall, depending on the lesion, horses can do very well following surgery. And I'm usually fairly open and honest with people. You know, if it's a large colon volvulus, based on what the colon looks like, I tell them up front, this is very serious. I'm very concerned. Um, you know, this horse probably does not have a great prognosis, but um, colic surgery is not a, um, a, a death sentence or a, oh, you know, don't do that. It doesn't work type thing. Um, there is a lot that we can do in colic surgery. There's also certain things like the stomach and cecum that we're very limited by. So um, again, we cannot do everything. Um, but horses can do very well with a, a lot of types of um, lesions. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And again, I'm sorry that I went off a few minutes over. No problem. Thank you so much, Dr. Vanderbrook. Before we take questions, we are going to do our prize drawings. And so we would like to thank our drawing sponsors, Barnyard Ingelheim. So they are a leader in equine health, developing innovative solutions for the well-being of horses around the world. So we have three winners for tonight. They are Sandy Germain, Amy Chapman, and Mallory Zantz. So congratulations to our winners. And we do have um, 
some questions in the chat and we have a couple of participants that have their hands up. Those that have your hands up, if you could type your questions into the Q&A section, we will get those answered for you. First question I have, um, if it is a lipoma, what are the chances of it recurring? Oh, great question. Um, thankfully, not common um, because lipomas take quite a while to uh, form. And so when we, like the, the images that I showed you of the horse with the lipoma, we, I not only remove that lipoma, um, and so that one will never cause a problem again, but I also explore the entire rest of the abdomen. So if there are other lipomas, I will absolutely remove those at that time. And so the horse will have to grow an entirely new lipoma for it to cause another problem. So um, uncommon for it to cause that problem again. Good question. Thank you. So if you are two and a half hours away from a surgical hospital, is it reasonable to trailer for colic surgery or will they not be able to handle the trailer ride? Um, no, definitely I would still trailer them in. The only one that is going to be um, the most problematic is the large colon volvulus. Um, we, we absolutely... Um, even if you're two and a half hours away, even if you're five hours away, um, we, they can still, we can absolutely still um, get them in, get them on the table and resolve the problem and have a fairly good prognosis, um, depending on what the bowel looks like. So it is not common um, for, for, for us in the state of Michigan to have things trailered in from anywhere from 30 minutes to, you know, the things up in the upper peninsula can be five hours or six hours or more. Um, and so it is not uncommon for things to be trailered in for that far away. Um, and they can absolutely do fine. Again, we usually say that kind of 75 mark is at the eight hour mark. So if the horse hasn't been colicking for that long, or, um, you know, we, we, figure things out and get going. Um, as long as we can get them within a reasonable period of time, um, within kind of that eight hour, the prognosis is still 75%. So I would absolutely still trailer in. Um, the the one caveat is like I said, the, the large colon volvulus case. And I'll say never say never um, because I have the, um, the furthest I've had a large colon volvulus trailer in and do well and survive was three hours. And so never say never. I would say, you know, absolutely send it in. We can evaluate and give it a try. Um, but those those are the ones where, again, like I said, because the colon starts to die within 30 minutes, those are the ones um, that are the most critical. But it might, you know, we don't know that that is what's going on until um, later. And so, you know, I would still always say, yes, please put them on the trailer send them in. Um, it's always a, a safer route to do that. There's there's a lot oftentimes that we can do um, with things. Is colic more likely to happen again after colic surgery? Yes, it is. That is a great question. It absolutely is. So horses that have colic surgery are at, ri at more risk to have colic again um, than horses that did not have colic surgery. So that is one of the reasons why, again, we only take horses to colic surgery when we have to. Um, strangulating lesions, there's no other way to um, save that horse other than colic surgery. You can't medically manage a strangulating lesion. So that is our only option. And it also shows why some of those impactions and displacements and things, um, we always try medical management first. Um, do horses have colic surgery and never, ever colic again? Absolutely. But they, it is a risk factor for colic in the future. So, um, so again, we, and it's not, I wouldn't say it's expected. So just because your horse has colic surgery, I wouldn't expect your horse to colic again in the future. Um, but if you were looking at all of the horses across the country that the ones that have had colic surgery and the ones that have not, um, it is the ones that have had it are, um, more at risk. So yes, that is true. I'm going to ask you one more and then we'll reach out to Facebook. Um, what can we do to prevent colic? Mm, good question. So a variety of things. Horses, for one, are are meant to kind of graze all day long. Um, they are like, if you think about the wild Mustangs, um, they are not meant to have big grain diets and not meant to be fed in meals. Um, they are supposed to graze all the time. And so 
the best thing for um for horses is to kind of eat forage all the time um grain um is is there is an association with um large grain diets and feeding horses grain and um the occurrence in episodes of colic and so that is one thing um the more forage and the more forage that they can kind of have all the time all throughout the day um definitely is is one thing that will help if it's not you know meals you know um, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, that, that is not how the horse's anatomy was meant to, um, digest food. So that would be one thing. Um, the other thing would be, um, you know, if you are, at least in Michigan, we have a lot of sand. Um, and so, you know, monitoring for sand, making sure to put mats down if you're feeding hay on, you know, a sandy surface or in a dirt lot, um, cause sand can definitely cause colic. Um, making sure that they drink plenty of water. So um, it, when I have horses in the hospital um, for for anything, whether they're coming in for, um, you know, laparoscopy, arthroscopy, a fracture, you know, anything else, um, I will oftentimes always give them a little bit of um, apple flavored electrolytes um, just because um, our water, we have city water here is likely tastes different than the water they're used to. And so if they're not drinking water, um, that will also predispose them to colic. And so I always give them apple flavored electrolytes to try and encourage them to drink water. Um, because again, the more water they're drinking, um, the more, the less likely they are to form an impaction. So I would say, you know, doing your best to avoid sand, um, making sure they're drinking a lot of water. Um, not feeding a lot of grain, not feeding meals, feeding things to kind of hay all the time. Um, those are probably the best things that we can do. However, horses are horses and horses will always colic. So um, just because we do all of those things does not mean they're not so going to colic. Those are preventative things we can do. Um, but all of the strangulating lesions, to be honest, most of the time, none of those have anything to do with management. So a lot of the ones that end up on the table um, are, I don't like to say bad luck, but they're, they are random, random events, random occurrences, and um, all the prevention in the world isn't going to stop those. So the impactions, that's a different story. Um, but most of the strangulating lesions are, um, are unfortunately um, just sporadic. All right. Uh, do we have any questions from um, our Facebook? I didn't see any, but maybe. yes, one just came in towards okay. the end. Um, so is the medical management for displacement the same as it is for impaction call it? Good question. And for the most part, yes. So we're a bit limited um, in what we can do with horses. So when I say medical management, um, that means mostly IV fluids um, and enteral fluids. So we place that nasogastric tube and we administer fluids every couple hours through that nasogastric tube. Um, and then also we do not feed the horse. So the horse will either be muzzled or in a stall without any, um, without basically in a stall with, with shavings instead of straw. Um, and so Basic, those are kind of the core of medical management. We give fluids IV, we give fluids via the GI tract, um, and then we do not allow anything other than fluids to enter the GI tract because if they have an impaction, if they have a displacement, filling it up and putting more things in there is not going to help it. Um, so fasting them and then um, IV fluids, enteral fluids, those are going to be the best thing for both an impaction and a displacement. So yes, the treatment is going to be very, very similar. Um, and then sometimes just giving them an NSAID. So one other point, which I guess I'm going to put a little plug out there. We use banamine a lot. Flunix and Meglamine um, is the, the actual drug name, but um, banamine, it is only meant to be given every 12 hours. Um, so if you give your horse banamine um, because it's colicky and it doesn't help, do not give it another dose of banamine. Um, unfortunately, that is not going to help the pain at all because you, it's already maxed out its receptors. Um, and it's only, especially if the horse is already dehydrated, it's only going to set them up for potentially kidney issues or, um, or other things down the line. So banamine is only meant to be given every 12 hours. Do not give multiple doses. Um, 
or even um, other other doses. So if you gave it banamine, um, don't then all of a sudden get it, get it bute if that doesn't help. So um, bute, banamine, and equiox are all NSAIDs. So all three of those are NSAIDs. Horses are sensitive to NSAIDs, so we do not mix and match NSAIDs. They can have one of those, um, but they cannot have one plus another one. Um, so they can have banamine, um, they can have bute, they can have equiox. Personally, I think that banamine has the best for... Um, visceral or abdominal pain. Um, so I would like banamine, but again, only every 12 hours, do not double up on your doses of banamine, um, because that's only going to, um, cause, cause kidney problems and problems down the road. And it's not going to help anyway. It's not going to fix the colic, giving them a second dose. So, um, so those are kind of our, our medical management. Um, we'll do flunixin or banamine. IV fluids, enteral fluids, and then fasting them. Um, if it's an impaction, I will really try to push the fluids. And so I will oftentimes give them eight, six to eight liters every two hours if they tolerate it. And when I say tolerate it, that means if, if it's still leaving the stomach. So if I always check for reflux, give the fluids, um, and then come back two hours later, check for reflux. If they have reflux, that means things are kind of backing up a little bit. So then we don't give more as we talked about, but, um, I will really try and push that and give them, if I can, eight every two hours to really try and, and blast that impaction. If it's a displacement, I might do, Maybe I'll do six every four. And the reason is because displacements, um, if they do end up on the surgical table, the bigger and the heavier and fuller that colon is full of fluids, the harder is it is for me to be able to get it out of the abdomen and, and get it right in the correct spot. So I sometimes am a little bit more cautious with displacements volume wise. But again, the treatment itself um, is going to be the, those same core things that we do.